Welcome back, everybody, to the Gold Club World Championship here in Beijing, China. I am Wolf. With me today is Grubby. And we're going to be bringing you guys some more coverage of this round, Robin. How are you feeling so far tonight, Grubby? Yeah, I'm feeling very good here. I mean, we're in this awesome giant hotel where all the players are receiving amazing treatment. Uh, the food facilities, everything, the, the playing, it's all fantastic. And uh, we are actually right here in this kind of giant ballroom with beautiful architecture and all the players are here in their uh, on two separate stages and we're about to start the second match here on this stream that's right and it is going to be between two chinese teams super perfect team and e-star and we are going to finally see full fleshed out rosters for the most part for these two teams which is something we didn't really get to see at blizzcon so going into this uh, upcoming china versus china match we're going to see a lot of fireworks i would imagine going into this round robin remember guys each match is going to be two games zero wins of course net two zero points one win well one loss is one point and two wins is two points you basically get a point per map that you yes. win <laughs> maybe that's the better way i should have uh, said it i mean, don't want to make it too easily that people like to be uh, intellectually stimulated so uh, yes <laughs> it is best of twos and because everyone is playing each other once we're going to get a lot of really good matches so these eight teams will all face one another once in this best of and it, it really will give you a sense of which teams are stronger than others and there's no lucky bracket there's no well he beat him but he lost to him you know sort right. of situation here it's going to be you against everyone else in the entire tournament so that's uh, obviously very important um guys i do want to get you guys to get out there and spread the word about this amazing tournament because not that many people know about it because it was you know pretty secret uh, for most of the time until it was finally fully announced and the, the fact that you and i are casting it as well as uh, dunk and dreadnought casting was just recently announced so please do you know get on your social media and spread the word about this tournament because this is basically the best here's the storm tournament we have had of all time oh yeah i mean when it comes to high level play we have three korean teams here we have three chinese teams here with the best team in europe Arguably, that's the one thing that you could say maybe Fnatic is the better team. We'll never know for sure. But we have Dignitas here, and we have NA's top seed in Astral Authority. And, of course, Dignitas did qualify through that regional. They did defeat Fnatic. They did have a better score at that time. Yeah, so, like, every second regional for BlizzCon, the winners of those, those were invited. And then there was that global wildcard qualifier, but uh, it was on the Asian server, and this is why Fnatic uh, refused the, the invitation. Like, it's... It's, you know, it, I don't know if you know how it works, but it's like pretty difficult to play with that kind of lag. So it is kind of like an Asian qualifier. Maybe if they like physically place themselves in Asia during it, they could have had a chance, but pretty big commitment. Yeah. Having said that, this is the sickest team pool that we have had in any tournament yet. Yeah, and it really does kind of lend itself towards the higher level end of play because Korea did snag uh, that wild card spot. You have three Korean teams, the first time in Heroes of the Storm history outside of OGN Super League to have more than two Korean teams in the same tournament. That's never happened before. They've got Chinese teams playing on their own soil global, like with a global competition, which has never really happened before, the exceptions of Korean teams going just a few of them over there to play in the Gold Club uh, tournament. So this is a really exciting tournament. This is something that I think a lot of people put a lot of time work into. Of course, our partners at NetEase and Neo TV are putting big work into this as well. So do spread the word about this, but we're gonna take a look at these two Chinese teams a little bit closer here. So take, out, uh, take a look at this video.金融倒下的时候 他们获得了黄银联赛的一个亚军，同时取得嘉年华以及世俱杯的一个参赛资格。这次阿亮、王星以及玄光玉的加入，非常期待他们在雪地方的一个表现。世俱杯氛围的话，这里的住宿环境
，其他队都挺强。我们的反正我们队内的目标就是先进胜者组。先进的小目标就是拿个五六名，就是别垫底。是准备了一些就是挺好玩的大招，专门用来对付就是我们觉得特强的队伍。可能中国队，两个中国队对我们比较了解，但是还有些大招没对他们用的，因为我们刚组嘛，就参加过一次比赛，他们可他们可能对我们也不是太了解。呃，比赛的时候我们拿出来会给他们带来意想不到的效果，给他们一个惊喜。那最后我想跟米萨卡说一句话，我们就是要教你 F 九二。There you have it, SPT or Super Perfect Team, uh, one of the three Chinese representatives here at the Gold Club World Championship. And there they are. What a cool nickname there, that second guy. Aloof Fool. It's yeah. like, you're a fool, but you're still like really aloof. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. Um, for me, the, the player that sticks out in this team most is Misaka. He's played on several Chinese teams really since the beginning of Gold Club. Yeah. He's role swapped away from ranged flex into more of the melee uh, warrior role, sometimes even playing melee assassins. And I do feel from looking at BlizzCon and, uh, you know, the end of this tournament that, that they, you know, led into watching Gold Club in the fall season, I believe he was one of the weak links for the team, especially once he started role swapping. And he's one of the best uh, ranged flex players in the world. Now here's E Star. Now E Star finally has this this solid roster here together, with the exception of Tao, who replaces Lucian because he was not allowed to play on loan by his team X team. So Tao's coming as a support, but he has a lot of international experience himself. Yeah, uh, E Star here, in my opinion, I'm not sure if everyone agrees, but like I think they are maybe the best or the second best Chinese team here in uh, representation of China. Zero Panda might be the best, but the cool thing about tournaments is you've got to show it right here and there. It doesn't matter how you're seeded, how people perceive you to be the favorite or not, you've got to prove it here. And so we will see. But I think E-Stars is showing pretty good form uh, recently. Yeah, Xing Xi is a player that everyone looks to as this guy does insane damage. He's so high impact. He's just a, a powerful ranged assassin, and he has been for, you know, really several splits of HGC. You talk to any Korean player, and he is going to be the one that gives that gets all the praise, all the respect when it comes to E-Star. Yeah, and I mean, it's pretty cool to get the respect from the Korean players who seem to be uh, pretty much solidifying their position in the Heroes of the Storm esports scene as the best players and the best teams. So to get their respect, they actually, a lot of them said they would like to individually face not just E-Stars, but Sing C, just to kind of feel what it's like to go up against him because he does damage very effectively and he's able to escape with his life uh, when others might have over-risked themselves. So, sure. very skilled players here on E-Star. He, e he really does push the boundaries. For me, I think this is a chance for E-Star to redeem themselves with a mostly full roster after what happened to them at BlizzCon where they had a fairly poor showing. You know, for most fans, they were a little bit disappointed and surprised and I feel like since Xiao Ti has officially retired, E-Star just doesn't carry the same name, the same weight that it did before. They had a fairly weak performance at Gold, at Gold Club as well. Yeah, it's kind of like what you said. There's like a second element of competition where it's like you against like the visa agencies, <laughs> like the embassy. Because, well, granted, sometimes these visas do create some issues. We've had a lot of really promising teams from China qualifying for world championships, and they were just not able to bring their full lineup, which is really quite a pity, you know, with the way countries and borders can sometimes work. But it means that this is going to be one of the first tournaments where we do see teams in their full or almost full uh, lineup. Uh, in SPT's case, it is their full lineup. E-Star, one player away. So very nice to see uh, closer or fully their full shape here in now, SPT versus e -Star. A super perfect team will go ahead and pick Braxis Holdout as their map choice, and e -Star will take Tomb of the Spider Queen, of course, Infernal Shrines and Towers of Doom being removed. Uh, Infernal Shrines, a map we see a lot of play on, but SPT looks like they kind of want to kind of change the scope of this map pool going straight into Braxis. And that's a map where we see really unique pushes and strong solo laning going on. Yeah, we also see a lot of emphasis on those four-man rotations on Braxis Holdout, which 
Uh, funnily enough, you would think there'll be one warrior, one support, and two damage, but I've seen some drafts here where a full-fledged warrior is omitted in favor of uh, something global like a Dahaka. Another really funny thing about this map, uh, Ban Pick Face, Garden of Terror and Black Arts Bay were not removed by either team, nor picked. Yeah. Normally, these two maps are slightly less popular at the pro scene because a lot of teams, they believe in their own power, and these maps tend to have a certain random factor to them, a kind of snowball element, where they would rather not uh, roll the dice and risk it, but neither of the maps were removed or picked, so they didn't try to like capitalize on the other one, leaving that open. So and, you know, China is no stranger to using uh, Garden of Terror at global competitions. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. starting with Edward Gaming back in the spring season in Korea, we saw a lot of Garden of Terror coming out of Edward Gaming, and see the Vikings played. So SPT here going with Braxis first leads me to believe they have a really specific strategy for the map going this one, because this is not going to be an easy matchup against E-Star. The question for me is, are we going to see Rexar peek into this draft? Because certain regions really favor him uh, on this map, and sometimes we even see him draw a first ban from teams because his value is be, being able to you know, use Misha to channel um, and also then, of course, be safe at a distance. If Misha dies, you're going to be okay. That's never going to happen anyways, but it, <laughs> that's worst case scenario, and you can really hold that channel and force a lot of pressure to that top lane. No, but it's true. You need to stand on that beacon on Braxis Holdout to channel the objective. Uh, ideally, you win the four man and the one versus one so that you can have both channeling, but at the very worst, you should have one of them. And Basically, that beacon is this tiny circle where you need to occupy it and make sure that your opponent is not. So it's like this wrestling match where you try to push the other out. Imagine being in like a wrestling match with a bear. That's yeah. pretty scary. And that's what Misha represents here in the Rexar Misha combination. Uh, another cool thing is the Panda. Panda Aaron Brewmaster, uh, Chen. He is a very strong pick here for the top lane as well. And we're actually going to go right into the draft. Great. I love nothing more. Than it uh, has been really going nice and fast, and well, we're going to see what E Stars is going to remove as they do have first ban and first pick. That's right, and you know, we're talking about Chen, we'll see how highly he gets prioritized. He was obviously used quite a bit uh, at BlizzCon at the Fall Championship, which really hurt MVP Black as Rich showed. It was clearly not really that well versed with the hero, made a lot of critical mistakes, especially in the series versus Fnatic. And, but uh, Fnatic had a pretty cool strategy there on that map with ETC, Tyrande, and Medivh suddenly pop out ETC next to one of the opponent's vulnerable targets, power slide right through them thanks to Medivh's portal, and then with the Tyrande follow-up, the blow-up, and that was a super cool, I don't know if it's cheese, but we haven't seen it again, and it was a really cool and smart strategy, and I think that's kind of why SPT is picking this battleground in particular, they're probably not quite the favorite in this matchup against E-Star, and so to pick a strategic map and maybe bring out some special strategy could be better than just letting it come down to fundamentals, right, Wolf? Yeah, I would completely agree, you know, and that's why I said it, when you really pull out Braxis this early, it, it does lend towards some sort of snipe strategy, and you said I don't know if I'd call it a cheese, I'd say I'd more call it like a combo. We've seen a lot of combos in Heroes of the Storm, even going back to TNL, Zagara, Void, Prism, it's a better way of saying it, yeah. Right? We see Vala actually draw an early ban here. This will allow E-Star to choose Zeratul should they want him, as he has risen quite a bit in priority with his recent changes. So that's something they might be looking for here. For E-Star right now, they're trying to wonder, they're trying to brainstorm here, what is SPT thinking? What do we want to deny, I feel, more than anything else in this first pick? Because that's the power of first pick on your opponent's map. You can try to ruin their plans right at the beginning. And now normally you'll see like a very high prioritization on first big Valas, ETCs, Muradins, Malfurions. I was wondering if maybe we'll see a more map specific pick or maybe a more team specific pick in that Zeratul that you alluded to. But it is going to be that Malfurion and probably not a very big surprise. And this is where we're going to start seeing SPT's map choice being validated. Nothing that happened so far could have really surprised them. And if they are planning to spring a special surprise here upon E-Star, this will be the time. Now, Sylvana's gonna get picked. She's really good at de pushing the Zerg waves that the opponent can send in your way. Uh, even really big waves get destroyed easily by the spreading of her Lost Soul dagger, uh, as well as the uh, Barbed Shot uh, at level 7, which does bonus damage to PvE. So, Sylvana's a great choice to de push the waves. Yeah, uh, if only Misako would be playing Sylvana's, I'd be super happy about it. Ariel will take the second pick here, or we've seen Ariel. Uh, go up quite a bit, and I think this is just simply because Malfurion was first picked. They want to bring Ariel to their comp. 
and it would li be likely banned in the second ban True. phase if they left it alone here. So we'll see if SPT can actually get the value they're looking for here. Xingxi looking to be doing the shot calling in this draft. You can see him there on camera as they are thinking about their next move. So nothing really we've seen from SPT screams strategy yet, although the Sylvanas pick this highly prioritized is quite rare. Yeah. So it seems to be they're trying to, I think, take the early game and try to snowball that um, with a strong push. And sometimes you've been seen on this map, the first Zerg wave can actually get you a keep. And sometimes that can lead to the game being in your favor so significantly, it's hard to recover. No, you're right. This game can literally be won by one team being level nine and the other six. Steamroll the keep down with Sylvanas and then go straight for the core. Uh, it happens from time to time on these two lane maps, as there is not a lot of experience you can get from the, the three lanes. There is only two uh, to come back from a deficit. Another cool thing about Sylvanas is there is this uh, strategy where you use her trait to disable the enemy fortifications immediately, going straight out of the gate for the opponent's wall, disable their towers, get bonus XP and start pushing. Now, if your opponent defends in the wrong lane, they will immediately be behind, and that will be a really great thing for SPT. And the chance that they choose the correct lane is 50-50. Yeah, it's it's tough to defend those early pushes. Now we see E-Star takes Gul'dan, so instead of trying to go down the Warrior Choke Path with the second ban they have, you know, available here, they're going to grab Gul'dan. Now Gul'dan really grew in popularity out of not only Dignitas, but also the Korean region, especially on this map because of his wave clear. They prioritize that de-pushing ability of the Zerg waves more than taking an early warrior, which means they won't have that choke ability. So SPT is going to have more opportunities here because even with ETC already banned, there are multiple warriors available here, Murden and Johanna. It's impossible to remove both. So Eastar not going to take that choke strategy, just going to, you know, basically go for, let's play the map specifically. Let's get this good wave clear. Yeah, and I think those two are the best, Gul'dan and Sylvanas at de-pushing the wave. So it's great to have one of them. Now, about that warrior prioritization, that's a pretty popular way of approaching drafts these days. It's going to be a Dahaka removal, but SPT could, in theory, pick up the next best warriors like Murdin and Johanna. And that will be a pretty decent way of uh, prioritizing those warriors and punishing E-Stars for not having taken one yet. Yeah, I don't think they'll do it here, obviously, now, because they, t they took Gul'dan, and if they um, ban one warrior out, they choke themselves, because SPT will simply just take the other one. This yeah. is a tough ban, actually, here for E-Star. Again, they're trying to figure out what SPT's plan is. They already took ETC away. ETC pairs really well with Sylvanas for getting those early pushes, because it's hard to actually punish those Sylvanas when there's an ETC nearby. He's so strong in the early game. And I think they're really just trying to figure out what range damage do we want to take away. Vala's already off the table. They've got Tychus and Gul'dan. And suddenly for range damage, there's not a whole lot of choices here for SPT that you're looking at for just auto attack, not non-mage damage. Yeah, I wonder if they'll remove Falstad for that global. Wow, they're going to remove Zarya. An interesting choice. Zarya is not the ban here that really comes out glaring. I was looking towards more the, the warrior, or excuse me, the range, uh, range damage doesn't. because you've got Tychus, well, I guess, Gul'dan, I guess Fall is removed. Range damage. Sure. <laughs> Especially, uh, you know, if you build out her grenades, then that can really do a lot of poke and uh, eventually kind of help close the gap and allow assassins to finish off those targets. It's an interesting ban. I think SPT is really thinking about the Fallstad pick right now. Another hero that's on the table, which we sometimes see push really strong with Sylvanas, is Sergeant Hammer. We've already seen Sergeant Hammer earlier, uh, you know, in this tournament, as we just saw it in the Korean matchup. So something we could potentially see here as well, usually, with so few left. Usually not too comfortable with the Sergeant Hammer against the Gul'dan, as you're probably going to get two stacks of corruption that he costs um, being stationary. And if you're just going to delegate yourself to, well, relegate yourself to uh, not sieging up, you're not utilizing the full potential. I think we'll see a warrior coming out here probably for super perfect team. Maybe Johanna, as Tychus is a pretty relevant auto attacker. Blind can remove that damage. Another thing that's really important on this map is taking heroes that don't run out of mana too soon. As generally, if you hardstone to go back to base to fully heal, you're going to give up beacon time. And it, it ramps up really fast. You can give the entire objective away to the opponent's team just for running out of mana. And look, I mean, we already have E-Star prioritizing two heroes that allow this to be less of a problem. Now, if Furin can innervate, Gul'dan doesn't have mana that he regens. He just simply uses his health for it. So his health pool is his mana pool, essentially. So they're tackling already this problem that you've discussed. Beacon time channels so quickly on yeah. this map. So if you actually hold both beacons and you can stall for time, that's just going to give you so much. Now, 
the Lunara pickup here is unusual, but yes. with Nature's Culling, it's going to you know really support clearing those waves, pushing really hard with Sylvanas, and it's a ranged assassin that's left on the table here, not as meta as some of the other ones have already been picked and banned away here, but SPT, SPT kind of got pushed into a corner a little bit with this one. Yeah, so now we have two heroes that do really good wave clear, give a lot of energy to Ariel, and what SPT needs now is a solo laner and a main tank. So main tank, probably Johanna. It could be Muradin as well, but Johanna is slightly more usual maybe, but both are okay. And the other one is going to have to be a solo laner for the top. And so it could be Chen, it could be Rexar. You know, we could also potentially see uh, Tyrael come in as a solo laner, and they may do what you were describing, forego the heavy normal warrior, just use Tyrael instead. It is going to be the Chen. So Chen's going to come in here. Okay, so this is their solo laner, which leaves E-Star as a... They have the same problem here. They need a warrior and a solo laner. So the solo laner could be Alarok. Alarok provides a very powerful synergy together with Malfurion because you can telekinesis pull an enemy into roots and then have a very reliable follow-up silence with that Discord strike. There's their solo warrior, the tank for the four-man rotation. Is the final one going to be Alarok, maybe Thrall, maybe even Zeratul? Yeah. Uh, Zeratul is a gimped solo laner, but he does provide a whole lot of extra team fighting ability. That's absolutely true, and it's not out of the question to have another hero rotate up to solo briefly while he does a little bit of roaming and, you know, pressure the poor man. Um, and he can do a little bit of camping as well. I'm leaning towards the Alarok pick. Uh, it feels a little bit more meta here. It can also be paired quite well with Johanna and um, getting a big Condemn or a Blessed Shield or both, depending on how the, the situation occurs. The only other choice really that comes to mind here is something like a Thrall, but I just don't feel like right now in this meta he really fits the bill, and his Sundering isn't going to gain an immense amount of value with this team. Perhaps it could line up some really nice Gul'dan Echoed Corruptions later on in the game, yeah. but the game doesn't usually go late. I mean, Echoed Corruption doesn't even always finish on this map. Yeah, well, it, it depends. Like, if he's in the four-man, he can get it pretty fast, but that's, like, in ladder games. Of course, SPT is going to try and dodge, though, so it's really down to skill here. Thrall, he also has a hard time catching up to Sylvanas Lunara. They're both pretty mobile, and he kind of has to run up and swing his big hammer uh, to actually get to them. Sundering can get kind of countered by uh, Crystal Aegis, so we'll see what comes out there. If it's not Alarak, it could indeed be Thrall. It could be uh, Vexar. Yeah, I don't think Sonya really fits the bill here because she doesn't have enough healing. She loses to Chen in the 1v1 lane, which means there's huge pressure to win the four-man rotation in the bottom. Absolutely. It is going to be the all Iraq we expected. A lot of time spent deliberating this choice. Ended up getting locked in at the end of all things. Now SPT... So, like, actually, since Johanna got taken away and they prioritized their solo laner first, they put a lot of stock in Chen beating Alarak, which I think is slightly favored in Alarak's favor, but skill also plays a big role. Absolutely. And then who's going to be the solo laner? It could be Leoric or indeed that Tyrael yeah. that you referenced. I mentioned the Tyrael earlier. I didn't think we'd see it paired with the Chen. Um, Tyrael will give Lunara a lot of power if Sanctification is placed correctly. Lunara could just do so much free damage. Um, when you think about Lunara and Tyrael, for me, I always think about Quagnix, the amount of value he gets in Europe on this hero. Yeah. If done correctly, I mean, you really do get massive, massive value. Chen is going to get some value. Chen will be nigh unkillable in this case, but he's not necessarily going to be able to do the damage um, that Sanctification is going to provide, just simply because even with his changes that make him a lot stronger of a hero, he's not the hero you think like, okay, he's on us, he's doing crazy damage. He's not a Sonya, you know, he's not really that big threatening melee hero that you're worried about Chen? when Sank's on him, yeah. Yeah, well, that's true, but when he turns on the Storm, Earth, and Fire, he kind of jumps on the backline and does a lot of damage with it. But yeah. outside of it, he has to play very carefully, especially against uh, Tychus. And I think we will see some Storm, Earth, and Fires going in uh, and then using the Sanctification to disengage when the, you know his spheres, of course, get very low and he wants to come back and survive. I guess my biggest concern here, Wolf, for SPT is the fact that Tyrael is part of their four-man rotation, and Tyrael is a fairly mana-hungry hero. Anyway, we'll see how that works out. The game is ready, and that is great news for everyone. We're going to be uh, looking at that one very shortly. But, yeah, who do you think is the better draft here? I would have to... I'd have to lean towards E-Star on this one, personally. But, guys, let's go ahead and jump into game number one on Braxis. We'll see you in the Nexus.
Here we go, SPT, Wings on Chan, Alupul on Ariel Misaka, bringing up material, Liang on Sylvanas, and Xin Xiao on the Lunara. That's the blue side here, SPT, super perfect team. On the right side, in the red, we're gonna have E-Star with Panda X on uh, Alarak, Panda Tao on, uh, on Malfury on X, uh, Xing Chen on Gul'dan, Misaka on Taikas, and TG on Johanna. That is right. So we'll see how well Tao comes in here on the Malfurion. Tao is actually known for, just like Tiger, playing a very aggressive support style. You remember Tiger's Uther, his builds <laughs> were crazy. Tao has the similar sort of idea, and we saw it many, many times in summer when he was playing for X Team, just simply how aggressive this player likes to play. In this case, just going to go for a Moonburn at level 1. I thought we might see Shandos. But it's just not as uh, useful in this case, the comp they've chosen. And we're going to see Johanna be very mana efficient as much as she can here. Wave clear is really strong as well, um, especially with her Knight Takes Pawn basically being baseline now. A lot of uh, juking around here from both teams as E-Star positioned themselves in the middle of the map to try and counter. What, what is happening? They're going with five man to the top. They're looking to punish this two, three, four man rotation here by SPT with five of them. Alarak is now going to go to the bottom. He's not going to miss too much experience. In fact, just one minion perhaps. Yeah, he just misses one minion of XP for the chance. If someone gets caught by SPT at the top to do a massive wipe of Super Perfect's uh, players there. But pretty cool uh, rotations there by both sides. There was not the usual like, oh, let's go with Savannah's four man on the tower. Uh, E-Star didn't pick wrong either. They sent their members in the middle of the map so they could respond quickly. Uh, just like SPT said in the video that we just saw, uh, the other Chinese teams may be fairly aware of our tricks. Yeah, and this is just a smart choice to make. Sometimes on three-lane maps that have, uh, they're not, they're asymmetrical. Like, for example, Sky Temple um, or Blackheart's Bay, it's a little bit tougher to actually react like that from the middle of the map. But on this map, you know, if you, if you're smart enough to realize the Savannah's push is real, the middle is definitely where you want to be. And we have seen Savannah's comps actually set up traps for situations like that to punish teams for going in the middle. It's a very meta uh, mind game that comes into compositions like this. Big stun going down here onto Xing Shen. He will actually recover quite well and start putting off massive damage on Misaka. A very positive trade here for E Star in a 3v4 situation because of those cannon towers. Did you see what Alarok did? He once again went to the top to help potentially in a 5 versus 4. This is so unusual. Usually you see people just chill the heck out there in the bottom lane, whether it's top or bottom. Uh, in that 1v1, they kind of just trade for ages, but he keeps coming up and trying to help his team member Xin Xiao. Uh, getting uh, away with his life just barely there, Chen Xiao. And already you can see Xing Xi's potential damage. I mean, it's crazy. Look at how much he pushes the boundaries. I mean, going nearly under turret there just to get a little bit of extra damage. And E Star has dominated this early beacon. Oh. Savage, though, might get taken out here. He's definitely going to lose the beacon. Does escape with his life, however, goes right back to lane. Yeah, he uh, manages to get out. Uh, he grabs the regeneration globe at the bottom as well. Keep in mind there is a globe generator in the north and the south that generates 20% uh, of healing and mana for whoever picks it up. Uh, every 45 seconds, either team can pick it up, so having that in your rotation really helps. Wings, oh, he's gonna go down. Wings goes down. Nice rotation there by me. I think definitely Misaka. some miscommunication by SPT. They should have been able to identify a rotation down. He was on top of the turrets. He was insanely greedy. No communication on that rotation from the top lane, and he gets punished as a result. And again, E-Star is consistently, because of Xing Zhen's amazing poke damage, winning a 3v4 lane. Uh, and this time doing it without being under turret. So, tough lane up there for SPT, not really getting the value that they wanted out of the Sylvanas pick so far. Try what they may. Yeah, generally, Sylvanas does really well when she's winning, but her morale and her effectiveness kind of drops when she's behind. Now, on this map, it's kind of different. Here, I wouldn't take Savannah only for snowballing elite. She's actually amazing at de-pushing the enemy Zerg waves, and we're gonna see that there in that top lane. Yeah, I mean, it's a 100% wave, but you can see uh, how, just how quickly uh, it is diminished, of course, by Sylvanas here. Liang doing a great job also building up that hope for Ariel to continue to heal. E-Star is not really pushing the issue here. We do see Xing Shan again just poking 
trying to find a little bit of extra value from Gul'dan. But this push isn't even going to take out the top fort, and they are forced to retreat. Sylvanas getting a lot of value, as mentioned, and Gul'dan will do the same uh, should SPT get a strong Zerg push. Now, something that not everyone may know, Lunara is a hero that scales more than any other hero in the game, pretty much, in the sense that she gets extra bonus damage uh, per level as compared to what others do. Uh, her poison gets more and more scary by comparison uh, relatively to others, so getting Lunara to the late game is always a very important element. Right now, her poison damage is really hurting on E-Star, but Come level 16, level 19, if it ever gets there, it's going to be extremely significant. Yeah, and I would say she gets a big power spike with the protection she is going to get from Aegis. Sanctification as well, even if she gets caught or mispositioned or perhaps silenced by Alarog, will be able to, um, you know, be healed up. The silence, of course, not really going to affect her in terms of escaping, but doing that extra damage. And uh, this game actually ends up being a slightly, uh, a slightly the E star, but not as large of a lead as you would expect based on their, their domination of the beacons. And it all comes down really to the Lunara and the Sylvanas being able to de-push that Zerg as you mentioned. Yeah. Because normally this map really starts to snowball after the first beacon, especially if you're able to get such a clear 100% versus zero. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen Sylvanas teams defend two to three consecutive 100% Zerg swarms from the opponent with relative ease, especially now that she has Barb Shot at level seven, dealing triple damage to uh, non-heroes, uh, uh, monsters, mercenaries, and minions. Gonna be very effective at it. And what we see here from Super Perfect Team is their draft strategy coming to fruition. They have a very defensive team. Everything about their team kind of screams that. Ariel, one of the best defensive supports. Tyrael, Sanctification, uh, two really great Ariel effects ranged damage dealers in Lunara and Sylvanas, but aren't really great at finishing people. It's just 100% defense. Yeah, it feels... E-Star has a more aggressive comp, but not by a whole lot either. Yeah, it feels very Fnatic-esque. Uh, yeah. And I keep bringing this up, but Fnatic plays like this oftentimes. They're a very defensive team. They're a European team, which is by nature a bit defensive. <laughs> Misaka does get caught a little bit here. Not nothing going to come of it, but Notice the focus as well on Sheng Zhen, though. I want to highlight his Gul'dan. He's always focusing down Liang. So Sylvanas is forced to be at the back and is unable sometimes to find damage. Savage, though, getting really, really low. Misaka's coming over. There's the heal. And just barely will Savage escape there, even with Misaka committing. And he will get punished, in fact, for that Aldruins. And Savage is not going to go down. Should he dodge this? Oh, he didn't dodge it, but no Archangel's Wrath for Tyrael has been picked up at level 1, so that will not confirm the kill. He has a Regeneration Master. He'll do a bit of damage to Alarak, but that is going to be the second takedown of the game here in favor of Eastar, who now reached level 10 just a and are starting to swap the beacon again. Now, the way that the beacon progress works, you get 2% per second that you control north and south. Once one of the beacons, uh, one of the team colors is to 100%, that's when both Zerg Swarms will be released. So you can have any percentage between 0 to 98 if you are the loser of the objective. Something that's really interesting here uh, that's a little bit less meta right now is we see Tranquility coming out from Malfurion instead of Twilight Dream. So he's going to be going for a little bit more sustainability. And I think this is somewhat of a counter to the longer sustained damage that we're seeing from Sylvanas and Lunara because you don't need burst healing against the slow damage. And in fact, the slow healing can kind of counteract it. Big Blast and Shield going down here. There's the fear as well. Chen is caught out. Wings. Oh. Storm Earth and Fire, and he goes after the other members here of E-Star. Everyone is dropping so low! Lunara and Sylvanas doing the damage, and Storm Earth and Fire Wings there going for the finish. That's one takedown. I thought maybe there was more in the cards here for Super Perfect Team, and what's more, they did not capture the beacons during all this yet. Look at Johanna there, buying a lot of time there, saying that, you know what, I'm kind of vulnerable, you should invest more time in going after me rather than going for the objective and he did get away which means that is pretty nice for him that was a delay and it still gives Eastar a chance to wrestle back the control of these beacons here yeah it's going to be two uh you know very healthy zerg waves it's going to be about even uh between these two at 96 to 80 currently on the scale and you can see the power of that Chen in that last team fight. You talked about it. Once he goes and drops his heroic and splits with the pandas, he's going to be able to find a lot of value there. A lot of cooldowns wasted for E Star. Again, the targeting here this time on Misaka to try to finish him off there. He will escape. Blessed Shield 
used here. Misaka oh. goes back and they're baiting this with an Aegis, but I think he will still go down. Sank has to be used. Misaka needs to be careful. He kind of drew a lot of resources there, going back in with 5%. I feel like it's probably his fault that Ariel is dead now. He had 5%, jump back in, drew two heroics to stay alive, and actually didn't really contribute to anything there. I feel like he uh, wings to Chen. He didn't really need help either. He jumped in right after a minigun on Tychus was used, which means percentage-based damage on Tychus was gone. Chen was pretty safe. He was just trying to occupy the beacon. And a bit of a mistake there by Tyrael. Now, the Zerg Swarm of Blue has already been cleared up. Yeah, a bit sloppy there by Tiger. It just uh, yeah. walks a bit too greedy. And again, Team Not Root, uh, you know, basically communicating the rotation. Wings actually going to commit to the Storm, Earth, and Fire here and try to go for a kill here. It's yeah. not going to be successful, though, and we'll have to back off. I feel like it was like, kind of greedy going for someone and also like kind of keeping himself alive in case there were more cooldowns available to finish him off. But a bit dodgy use of the heroic there. Uh, both teams not necessarily at 100%. Would have to agree with that. Uh, definitely seeing some less than characteristic mistakes on both sides. Maybe the nerves coming up here a little bit high as these two teams have played together so many times yeah. in so many tournaments. They know each other's styles so well. I feel like SPT's style is working out. Their draft is getting more value than E-Stars. I think Misaka just needs to tighten up his play a little bit. He's going a little bit too aggressively when it's not warranted. Yeah. And this is something we saw from Misaka at BlizzCon as well. Play, uh, you know, fans are very critical, and analysts as well, very critical of Misaka's almost YOLO, Devil May Care attitude <laughs> in some of these fights. And it's cost them a uh, big time in this first game for SPT. Yeah, it's not really fun to, like, to point it out, but it has to be said because it is a weakness that he needs to work on. Um, some players play too passive, others too aggressively. And in this case, it did cost a bit. But having said that, the general team strategy is working out. SPT up one forward. Uh, roughly equal levels and are doing pretty good on the objective control. And keep in mind, every second that they stay alive, Lunara is going to get more and more potent, relatively speaking, with that really well scaling poison damage. Yeah, it's as if SPT said, we're going to take a map that snowballs and usually is decided early, and we're going to force late game on it. Oh. We're going to break the rules. Oh, that's Alarok. He's down. He's completely in no man's land versus two. Uh, SPT gladly makes use of that. Blessed Shield in the meantime misses. In the north lane, there was the comeback attempt there by E-Star, trying but to make it a one-for-one. One. You know, SPT dropped Sanctification just the same, and that's a 25-second net uh, you know, value for E-Star for the cooldown sure, trade, so yeah. I guess it works out yeah. at the end of the day for them. Bit of a sloppy move there to still commit to the Sank. They're jumping in here on the Xing Xi. They want to kill him. The Wailing Arrow connects really nicely, but now with Tranquility, they're going to try to turn this fight, and SPT needs to leave. They cannot commit to sticking around. Once that Tranquility is there, don't forget the bot lane is being pushed. They're getting value from this five-man. SPT not rotating down to deal with that camp. Now, Wolf, that was a really great reaction time there by E-Star Malfurion. Turning on Tranquility just microseconds before the Wailing Arrow hit meant that he could keep his allies alive uh, instead of uh, maybe two to three people dying. So great Tranquility timing. The turnaround now is cooldown, almost died. Sing Chen still alive, still putting out fell damage there with that fell flame and corruption and Odin gets used here to secure the top beacon. One apiece which stops the beacon progress at 60% for SPT. Yeah, big counter strike there, blocked! Oh. Fire of Chen, it puts it on a 10 second cooldown, effectively consigning him to an early death. Oh, nice warp by going down here as well. There's Shin Xiao, he is dead. And Liang, thought he was getting away. Savage is there to knock his health down. See Misaka having to use Sanctification again, this time defensively solo. <laughs> and ends up being two kills to nil. Isar taking a great trade here. Gonna actually try to get maximum value off of this globe as well as they retake the bot beacon. Yeah, very negative synergy there with the Crystal Aegis and Chen, Storm Earth and Fire. Either one of them might have saved him, but the combination of both was crucially fatal. Yeah, it was so well timed against the Counter-Strike attack. Yeah. It just, just simply didn't matter because it ruined his life afterwards. It was lose-lose there. Uh, you could almost argue might as well just don't burn the cooldown. It is three seconds to go on that one. Huge damage actually coming out. Savage with these blanks has been getting a lot of value on, on all the rock. It hasn't necessarily really been about his CC. It's more been about just his damage and his big flanking silence. He's a wailing arrow man on a short cooldown. Oh, Chen, nice! 
isolation there on Chen. E Stars gets a kill even as they summon a 100% Zerg Swarm. This could spell a really big advantage here in the game for E Star as there will not be Chen to defend. Now, when Chen comes back, all heroics are available, but crucially, SPT will be down a talent. And I don't see how E Stars doesn't get a keep here, maybe even more. Easily. And Liang is in the bot lane actually dealing with that Merc push. Finally, does clean it up. But that's the hero you really want here. You want Sylvanas yeah, to and e I think push. He needed, here, needed to be here from second one. I completely agree, because going to the bot and cleaning up those mercs is significantly less important than actually dealing with this, which is going to cost them a keep, and potentially more. But it looks like E-Star is going to just go ahead and play this a little bit safer, not going to get too greedy, will be satisfied with the keep, and will rotate away. I've seen some cool strategies where you leave one Guardian alive to halt the next Zerg wave from spawning. You leave it at one HP, you continue to tank it as uh, a hero and just kind of freeze that from ever happening again. Um, not something that SPT wanted to do. They clear up fast. They actually are kind of eager to go onto the map. They get the level 16. And at this point, SPT is in a situation where they're going to get extra pressure on them. We've got Catapults pushing in the top lane now, the first one, exactly in the north, which means that SPT has been put on the timer. Absolutely. Level 16, 17, minute 16 Catapults. Not too bad yet, but fast forward five minutes and it becomes this huge kind of looming pressure. So look for SPT to maybe set a trap, maybe force the fight, kind of accelerate the pace of this game. That's that's absolutely true. And, you know, maybe the boss is going to be where they try to force that fight. The top lane will be lost for the rest of the game, which means the top beacon is almost essentially impossible to get without a net uh, body lead. Really, you need to get a, multiple kills if you're ahead in bodies, then you can win the top lane, then you can win that top beacon. Obviously, beacons haven't spawned yet, but they want to take a fight before 20, if possible. This could be that fight. Misaka does get pulled in there by the Condemned. It looks like they just want to heavy push this, five manning it, but uh, we do see that E-Star will respond the same way bringing five down. They're not going to lose a fight. They don't need to. And they don't need someone in the top lane right now because just simply going to naturally push yeah. by way of the catapults. Yeah, uh, that Raven uh, Raven and Goliath cap is pretty strong to go up against the catapults. And, you know, during all this, when E-Stars was attacking with the Zerg wave, there was a uncontested Zerg push by a uh, super perfect team at the bottom. It did take off 60% of the keep at the bottom. So one single death here for E-Stars. This could be it! They're going for Johanna! The holy ground! Uh, Misaka isolates him away. Johanna, she has no more shield. Dropping to 50%, but it's not enough. Tranquility goes on. Wailing Arrow hits. And this could be a turnaround here for E-Stars. They've weathered the storm off super perfect team. Misaka gets pulled in with the telekinesis. Oh! Goes down. Silenced as well, so couldn't use Aldruids to escape. <laughs> and that is a kill there for E-Star. The catapult push in the top lane is insanely strong right now. Looks like E-Star again is not going to try to push the issue and win the game off of this, but instead just conservatively back off, take the beacons, continue that hardcore top push with the Goliath Raven push you were talking about. That mercenary camp is going to be pushing. This means Liang is off the map. Uh, Tyriel is off the map for 15 more seconds, and E-Star can simply take beacons and invade. They're just taking every safe advantage they can right now, not trying to end the game, just looking for really to get that second keep and basically just secure the win that way in the slow, longer game. They're faster approaching 20 as well than SPT could ever really imagine to do. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, It was pretty much between four versus five contesting by SPT, which is pretty crazy. Or the equally crazy thing of consigning your second keep to death by this huge mercenary and Zerg wave that's about to spawn here in the bottom for E-Stars. Now, E-Stars, they can smell blood in the water. They take down this keep and they play it safe. They go to level 20 and they've pretty much got the game on lockdown. That Absolutely. is their goal right here. That should be their goal. Now, if E-Star overextends and says, like, let's get the keep, let's get more, that is probably SPT's best chance here. That might be what they're hoping for. But let's first deal with this Zerg wave. Here. Yeah. And, you know, E-Star has been so conservative. I just simply don't think that is going to happen. I don't think they will have any overextensions here. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they just turned around and left right now. Again, yeah. Just going to let these Guardians kind of help buy them some time. A commitment here, though, for SPT. They want to get that pick. Wings dives in. Leong is also on the chase here. Tiger, though, turns around. Tranquility is popped. And SPT is not going to get this fight they wanted. No, in I fact, saw, they may lose more. I saw zero reason for SPT to move forward here once Tranquility was popped. It was actually popped too early by Eastar saying, we don't want to fight yet. I'm not sure why Eastars turned back around as well. They don't have Tranquility. They're going back in here. They're kind of hurt, and they're going up against this big splash damage. Both teams, I feel like, overstepping 
what they uh, should be capable of here. However, Eastar smartly did save some heroics and with some really nice execution. They get Ariel there, Alarak pulling that in. And yeah, I mean, that's going to be a kill for Eastar. Wow, here. they're still not going to try to end the game yet, despite the fact they have three catapults in the top lane. They're going to try and get level 20, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think the reason why Eastar did turn around. Uh, was it, first of all, I do agree with you. I think it was incorrect, but I think they were trying to get that horrify value, and it worked out ish. But with the Ariel kill here, it's not enough to end the game. They decide, you know, they may have been able to push the envelope really far using that top push, but they're just simply going to turn the map red here, take every camp that's available, and force SPT into fight. My only qualm with this is it gives SPT the best chance to potentially get a lucky pick or a lucky kill, yeah. even against 20. Yeah, as long as there's nothing else that's really good on the map, uh, like no major objective, no Zerg Storm, no beacons, it's not too bad for SPT to continually defend the top and the bottom lane. The biggest threat here is that one, E-Star gets the boss, two, level 20 is not reached for SPT by the time the next beacon starts, or number three, while they are de-pushing top or bottom, there's a collapse, five versus less than five, by E-Stars versus Super Perfect Team. I feel like right now would be a perfect opportunity for E-Star to try to boss. They are baiting it. They are faking it here. Misaka is the one who gets caught. Telekinesis goes down. Big Aegis, though, and a huge Willing Arrow, but Tranquility will go down. This is going to be the fight that decides the game here. Tychus is dead. That's a five versus four. They are out for blood. 19 level still, but they have a man in the lead. There's no Counter-Strike. Alarak! Alarak, the boss wakes up! The boss wakes up! And Sylvanas jumps in, confirms the kill on Alarak. It's five versus... Look, it's four versus three now. Yeah, but there goes down Xin Zhao as well. Wings is going to try what he might. Misaka is coming back over here. Tao, will he go down? He gets the root here. This is actually totally crazy at this point in time. Wings trying to do what he can. Misaka comes in to try to give him a few more shields here. Oh, there's too much healing there by the Drain Life. But go down the cliff. But Leon is back. Team wipe here! Two warriors stand against three. Leung, Hearthstone on the right side of the map. Went back, came with full power again. But in the meantime, at what cost did it come? The core is dropping to 50%. There's catapults, there's mercenaries. They scramble to defend their core, which will be left at about 40% HP. And that five-man wipe did come in a staggered pace, which means E-Stars, they're getting Tychus back, they're getting Alarak back. Good job on dying that early in the fight. You're back now to stave off the apocalypse. But this could be SPT's chance to get back in the game. There's a lot of pressure on them on the map. I, There's backdoor potential. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is why I'm like, E-Star, you need to really put some pressure on ending the game because every team fight opportunity you give to SPT could go in their favor, could win them the game. That Wailing Arrow was so beautiful, so many abilities yes. couldn't be used. The Tranquility is so much later than Tao wants it to be. And next thing you know, this is SPT's fight. Leong, the fight goes on so long, Leong respawns, comes in, ends it. <laughs> E-Star isn't well, thinking well, about that. Well, you're right? Yeah. Uh, Leong, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. And then finally they got the damage. Uh, great job there, M Misaka, to redeem some of the moves. They're staying alive at 5%, continuing to add value. Wings, he drew a lot of the cooldowns here. Telekinesis, Discord Strike, he turns on Storm Earth and Fire. Wings has been playing an amazing game. They get that keep that was so low already, and they're still Broodlords here. They're moving in, Tranquility goes down. Malfuron, Malfuron, 20%, 10%, Heals and he's himself. gonna ice block. Ice blocks, he's so low, but he does keep that value oh. going. There's the kill on Wings, Leong does get telekinesis, he goes down as well. The core is still at mostly full shields. That is not going to be a sank to change this fight. It looks like Xin Zhao is going to be the next to die. Yeah. And it looks like a big overextension here for Super Perfect Team. Their and core, it's going to be another wipe. And the core lost shields again. There is one Cyclone there, one Catapult. Uh, a, a really very <laughs> over eager here by SPT as they basically pushed into a Tychus with his upgraded Odin. Big red button. Yeah. That's nuclear missiles there with your Ragnarok missiles. Would you like anything else for breakfast? Good sir, yes, that was too much here. And that should just simply be a game. GG is called here as the core will eventually die once it gets another target from that catapult. And that is gonna be it. SPT decided they needed to push for the win there. They're unable to get it. And that will be <laughs> game over. So Eastar <laughs> will take the first win here on Braxis. There you and have it. <laughs> minions won 100% of the core damage.
is done by Minions. Uh, great job there by Eastar. Not as comfortable as maybe they would have liked, but certainly very exciting and interesting. And they did secure the win in the end move. Yeah, um, that Leong Hearth coming back, uh, coming to get those last kills was a little bit scary there, honestly, for Eastar for a moment. But again, it's funny to see how these Chinese teams, if you've never seen games like this before, watch Gold Club, because I mean, you and I have watched countless games from China. It looks like this a lot of time. This is not like a, uh, you know, one of the diamonds in the rough for Chinese versus Chinese series. We see games like this all the time. It's just funny to me to see the insane aggressiveness in team fighting, those commitments. But when it comes to macro, it's like, nope, everything's safe. I'm just going to back off. I'm not going to push the, the issue. Nearly cost E-Star that game just simply because they wanted to commit to a 20 fight instead of pressuring the lanes, which was smart. They cleared the, the entire map off, but they could have actually tried to push for the win, I feel. They didn't do that. They lost that one team fight, but they were still able to stabilize afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty scary, actually, the way that unfolded. Um, now, that is one map to E-Star. It is a best of two here in the Gold Club World Championship. Brown from it with eight teams, which means we'll see one more map between these two. And in that first game, I do agree, Wings was the MVP. He played a fantastic Chen there for SPT. Really, I think he jumped in at really good times. He almost never got blown up just like that. Uh, as Chen, you need to be very mindful of the cooldowns of the opponent. You don't have some of the buttons that you can press to instantly save yourself like some other warriors have. I think he did really great, but it just wasn't enough. Yeah, it certainly was not. And I feel like with some of the, if I had to give a LVP, which we don't do, I feel like if Misaka had been in more better positions, maybe Wings could have gotten even more value. And that just really speaks to Wings skill. I mean, even without really a bunch of great sinks, I mean, Misaka's sinks where I'd say two out of three times used to save himself. Yeah. Well, it wasn't giving the team value, wasn't giving Lunara that value, wasn't giving uh, the value on Sylvanas. Um, a great game by E-Star overall. You see the 15 to eight kills. And uh, obviously we went to the late game on Braxis with the comps we saw there. Not on Tuma Spider Queen, but on, in fact, Braxis holdout. Yep, uh, we see that uh, boss that uh, did have a small cameo here in this game as it woke up, did a few shots and went back to sleep. That was pretty cool. That was where Leung actually walked past the boss and helped the boss to finish off someone. Hearthstone on the right side and came back, uh, which leaves E-Stars there with that one win. And this does leave, of course, uh, to go to Tomb of the Spider Queen for game two. And Tomb of the Spider Queen is another map that uh, we will see very likely a longer game on, possibly post-20, which is why it's the go-to map for I mean, teams like Fnatic. I mean, Braxis Holdout is supposed to be like a shorter game. Yeah. And <laughs> now we're going to get the long map. Yeah, uh, and if these two teams <laughs> keep playing as safely as they did, we might hit level 30, Grubby. We this, might uh, hit November 27th. Yeah, we <laughs> might be here all night. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, yeah, they, I mean, they played both aggressive and passive at like different times than maybe we're used to in different regions. So it is really fun to see how these regions have different play styles there. Savage had some really uh, good play on all I feel, in that last game as well. It's something that they saved that for their last pick, but I think that's something that Super Perfect Team definitely needs to really think about going into this next draft because Alarok is going to be really good on this map because of the shortness between the lanes. Look at what he was doing on this battleground. Yeah. He is going, granted, a relatively smaller map, but it still takes quite a while with the way, not that the bird flies, but that the Alarok bounces uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to get all the way to the top lane. And he was willing to do it, give up lane experience, to have just the potential to follow up on some kind of CC chain that his team might be setting up in the top. Tomb of the Spider Queen, ha half the distance, if even. Uh, they're gonna be able to uh, yeah, go all the way there. But let's take a look at what E-Stars has to say about their running up into this Gold Club World Championship.
这个队伍的话，他们其实从风暴一开始的比赛打到现在，他们在国内取得的成绩都还不错，但是每次遇到国际比赛的话，总是会欠缺一点运气，所以这一次希望他们能够在水立方真正的证明自己。以前那个意思大，除小 T 以外，其他人听他听他说细节就行，就我们只需要做好自己，把自己的个人能力体现出来就行。那现在意思大的话，他们走了之后，更需要一个能移，就凝聚这股力量的人嘛。每个人的想法都变多了，出现。分歧的地方也很多。这个游戏很吃五个人的统一执行，然后各种想法要凝聚在一起。缺少的就是一种一种控制力和沟通吧。我们大部分都在跟就韩国队了，确实挺强。我们很多细节都是跟他们学的。比赛和训练赛其实是就有点截然不同，可能我们就是打到那个感觉了，就是也讲不清，可能就打得特别好，确实还有很多问题都。没没有时间去解决，我们套路很多，但是我也不可能说出来吧。这次世界杯还是目标还是冠军吧，毕竟是自己主场。打败 MVP Black 的雄心我一直都在，但是至于能不能登上冠军宝座，就没有百分百的把握吧，有百有百分之五十的把握。在这里，我一场都不想看你们输。Said that they want to beat MVP back badly. Do they want to badly beat them? Like they really want it dearly, or do they want to beat them in a very rough fashion? Uh, tough, tough. Um, tough to say. Gonna have to ask the translator on I, that one. Either way, I think they want to win. It's, I it's lean towards <laughs> it. Like they want it really badly, just because of the rivalry between Black and East Star that we've had for so so long, especially in the Shao T era and MVP Black's uh, you know 40 plus win streak where we had. Uh, MVP Black just untouchable. Yeah. Um, the Black Age, as we like to call it. <laughs> During that time, the rivalry between E-Star and Black was real because Black was consistently traveling to Gold Club while playing in OGN Super League. And they were literally flying on planes twice a week between Korea and China and winning everything while doing so. And it, do they actually call it the Black Era? They call it the Black Era, yeah. Does or it the, like translate, the Black Age. Does that translate to Korea? Yeah, everyone just calls it Black Age. Oh, like, like literally like the aging. English uh, yeah. Age. Oh. Um, at, at least in my experience talking to people about it. Cool. Um, now we're going to Tomb of the Spider Queen. Obviously a map where Wave Clear is as... I wouldn't say it's as important as it is on Braxis, but it is very important for lane pressure and rotation. Well, you routinely have compositions here that are designed at killing heroes. You'll see one team go six takedowns versus zero and still be behind in experience just because they give up a lot of wave clear. The, the waves seem to come faster, they don't really, but there's just so much minions to clear that you can just win the game by taking heroes like Leoric, Tassadar, used to be Zagara, and a whole host of other heroes that specialize not just in kill pressure, but just in killing the lane uh, minions. Sure. We see the target ban um, on Malfurion, also be a respect ban from what we saw from Tao. Obviously, uh, the tranquility usage against SPT's style really did throw them off. It's really the only heroic in the game that gives that amount of su sustain uh, sustained healing uh, over a large area. Yeah, the, like the jug of 1000 cups does fine, but it will get cancelled by Wailing Arrow, whereas sure. tranquility is a kind of status effect that allows you to do anything except mounting during that time. Healing and abilities, and it can't get cancelled. Also, 1000 uh, jugs is going to... Um, also like you know it's it's aoe healing kind of but it's also somewhat fast single target healing yeah, yeah, that yeah. eventually becomes aoe whereas tranquility is going to gain value um substantially throughout the entire healing output now e-star will toss the band down onto etc again uh as we saw in the previous set so knowing spt's play style we'll see if they actually decide to go for a little bit more of the warrior choke out this time to try to limit the amount of tanking we could see from spt with the Malfurion ban, this time we're going to see Vala picked up first pick here for SPT, which means there's a lot of, uh, you know, counterplay here for E-Star. They could pick up Tassar, for example, try to build a comp around him, um, or even Ariel as well. These two heroes that have done so well historically with the Vala rework. Yeah, and maybe even both, because 
both indeed offer so much to Vala that uh, it would give you the options to use someone like Vala uh, for Tassadar Ariel and also take that away from her. She has performed really well in the last weeks and months when you have that Tassadar with it. So really good uh, job there. We'll be calling that out. And Eastars is indeed going to be doing that. Going to go with the Tassadar. And here is the big question. Are we now moving into the Warriors or will it be the second one that synergizes so well with Bala in Ariel? Eastar has 134 seconds to make that decision if they want to eat into their time pool. We'll see uh, what they're going to be going with. If it's not Oriel, they could pick their own damage dealer. Okay, they're going to take Johanna. I think this goes back to the wave clear I was describing earlier. Um, and this may force SPT to, you know, pick a warrior here right away. We saw a little bit more of a unique warrior style from them in the previous set, uh, bringing in the Tyrael uh, with the Johanna. But we might see them just simply take Murd in here for the safety of having that strong warrior, um, you know, that's that's so meta right now. I feel like Leoric would have worked fine for SPT instead of Tyrael last game. Would because have to agree, especially considering how little value Tyrael's <laughs> sanctification gave I mean, them. They both have really good traits for dying, which Misaka did, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> suffer a few Shots times. Shots fired! <laughs> but, but also, like, in the sense that Sylvanas and Lenara pretty much only get to attack the front line, and so does Leoric. So it would have synergized really well with the type of damage that SPT was putting out in that last game. And it would really isolate Johanna to kind of have to stand still there, not get away with Iron Skin. So I would have liked it, but yeah, we're going to get see that synergy that we spoke about there with Ariel and Vala, now that second hero. Uh, Murden is still available. He doesn't seem as popular in China as in ETC, even though he's pretty much put on the same pedestal in Europe. Yeah, and in Korea and in as Korea. well. Yeah. Um, so let's see if they decide to pick him up here, because now that they've chosen Ariel, that was something that E-Star was definitely considering banning, and I think it's almost a must pick for SPT with this Vala comp. Let it go, e is gonna ban that. Now that that's off the table, I think E-Star is looking for the Warrior Choke if SPT decides to go for maybe some more range damage here. Um, Ballstat okay. is off the cards, by the way. Obviously, with his uh, further nerfing of his Q builds, he's fallen down quite a bit with his little presence. Very valuable, except on smaller maps. He's not as True. useful. Like this map, for example, you could simply rotate between the lanes with his uh, Tailwind. I mean, yeah. he gets there pretty quick. Yeah, I think you would draft him here to disengage from Leoric and Tomb, rather than the fact that he can fly across the map. Yeah. Uh, one more thing to consider here is that Malfurion was banned by SPT. They pick Ariel, which in Europe, it generally means Brightwing is the next best support. But in China, they feel Rhaegar is the next best. Sometimes Karazim can be paired with Tassadar as well. Um, so if we consider that Rhaegar might be coming out here from Eastar just because of the way that China prioritizes it, what do you then want to take as damage dealer or tank by SPT? What kind of punishes a Rhaegar player as opposed to what you would normally face in a Malfurion or an Ariel? Well, I think hard CC is really important, obviously, to stop the wolf, even though that right afterwards he can't escape um, if he's not basically essentially eliminated or locked into multiple CCs. Um, that's something to keep in mind. Because they take cooldown here and go for that extra range damage, I think a ban on Muradin is pretty warranted at this stage in time. The other ban that we could see is Zarya. We have seen the pairing with Ariel and Zarya to keep Vala alive and make her less risky. And we didn't see E-Star prioritize that ban in the previous set. So Zarya is definitely something to keep in mind because it is kind of a warrior, yeah. you know, by by you know technicality, not the solo warrior you really think about every time, but definitely one that can be played as such, which we've already seen in China. So. Um, definitely something they're considering. I think you're really looking at the Zarya and the Murden picks here, or rather, uh, bads here for E-Star. Now, they take away the Tyrael, though, which is something we saw in the last set, but with the very limited success, I, I'm not a big fan of that ban myself. No, neither am I. I guess I guess this is like down the ladder after Johanna ETC. They, they actually prioritize uh, Tyrael removal. Bit surprised about it as well. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the direction they want to go in next for E-Stars in the draft. Or maybe they even try to make Misaka more uncomfortable than he, according to you, generally seems to be. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you know, I've always been a big Misaka fan. I loved his uh, Sylvanas play. And in Gold Club until the finals, he had like a 7-0 and win rate on Sylvanas. Played her a ton in summer as well. He and Yao Yao really showed the strength of Sylvanas from China. Um, but, you know, with his role swaps, I feel like he just simply isn't as good right now. It's going to take him some, some time to get used to that role. 
Tigus is banned here, no big surprise. Uh, it's really, when you take Bala away, he usually ends up being the biggest ranged auto attacker um, that's prioritized in the game. And with Gul'dan removed as well, it's just simply a safe ban. Here's the Rhaegar that you were talking about coming in here, going to pair well with the Tastar. The question is who they're going to bring in as their melee assassin. There's a few, you know, good choices here. I think we might see a gray main come out potentially. He's pretty decent against what SPT has so far. Oh, wow, it's actually going to be Illidan. Now, this is going to be something to be on here, Wolf. You yeah. know this, seeing 10 on Illidan is going to be so sick to watch. He's got the perfect setup so far. They removed Johanna, actually, by picking her. So there's no blinds against him in that sense. And then they have that quintessential traditional support that we've always seen, that and duo in Tassa Rhaegar. And I think it really just lines up for a perfect slide-in fifth pick leaning, just going to, you know, reel it off with that extra range to damage, very powerful, uh, poking and denying turn-ins uh, of you know, for the web weavers as well. Yeah, and I think you're right. Uh, so that is the last pick probably for them. So SPT now has to choose how do we counter Illidan. Now, Muradin is a soft counter for Illidan. I wouldn't say it's a super hard counter. Europe might be inclined here to pick up a Lily. It would also kind of deal with Oriel's sometimes limited support. Uh, Zarya would actually be a pretty decent pick as well. Uh, not necessarily because of how Shield works against Illidan, but just to kind of protect Vala, Gul'dan, and Ariel when they start taking heat from Illidan. I'm a big fan of the Zarya pick. You can use Expulsion Zone to isolate Illidan, punish him for, you know, if he goes in and it goes poorly, he can't retreat as well if the Expulsion Zone is actually locking him in. Um, out. Or, right. Yeah, you, know, he's, you lock him out of escaping. You know, he's locked in <laughs> with you. If, you. if you use it in a choke point, for example, he can't actually get back to his team if his dive-in is used incorrectly. Even if he runs away immediately, that's a 50% slow that Expulsion Zone delivers for a while. But it's actually going to be Arthas coming out here, who is also sometimes used as an Illidan counter, as he does pretty good single target damage. He can kind of slow Illidan. But what's more, he generally goes for people that need to follow Illidan. So like he'll go for the Rhaegar or the Tastadar or the Li Ming that we might see coming out. I don't really like it though. I I'm, think it's I, a, I'm a little pick. bit worried about the Bala and Gul'dan survivability. These two heroes that will have a large health pool and are going to be easily dove upon by Illidan. Now Arthas is going to alleviate some of that in different ways, but I really felt the Zarya just hard shield she's going to provide or the Lili blinds potentially to stop this die from being so powerful. Uh, That's what I was really feeling and looking into. Uh, of course, if you shield someone, Illidan easily can switch targets, so it's not that it's going to be that effective. But E-Star can always come up with another, uh, you know, ranged damage here that can be countered better by Zarya. So, yeah. I, I really think Li Ming is the almost obvious choice here for E-Star. If mean, it's not, I guess it could be Lunara... Sylvanas? Sylvanas not too bad, but it does kind of put you in an awkward spot in terms of damage. Illidan is not going to be topping the damage charge, usually. And Sylvanas can only attack the front line, and she doesn't have Giant Killer, so you don't generally want her to go up against Muradin or Arthas. Balstad coming in. Again, we talked about his uh, global presence being somewhat less impactful on this smaller map, but it still is useful, especially once you hit post 20, or really once you get Gust, you can change fights with it, even without Leoric. So, Something to keep in mind here with the Falstad pick, and even with uh, his Q build significantly worsened uh, through the last few patches, he's still pretty strong. And I mean, we might even see, I mean, it's not actually out of the question um, to even see an auto attack Falstad, but I really personally feel it's quite strong and is something that we are going to see rise to, to power in the future as players just get better at positioning. Because I think if you position correctly and you have the right heals for yourself, I mean, Boston's going to get massive value. And if he's constantly able to use his tailwind to rotate between lanes, get that attack speed buff very quickly. Um, and also the changes to Marksman recently that allow him to <laughs> scale later yeah. on in the game as well. Could be what we see here. Pretty unlikely. I'm really just kind of reaching no, at I, straws for what I like. Actually, but. I do think we're going to see season Marksman. You need that giant killer to deal with Arthas and Muradin. So season Marksman, secret weapon, giant killer at 13. I do think we're going to see it. I'd be surprised to see mage builds coming out. The sensation you get when you play ranged assassin behind Illidan. Illidan is kind of like a lightning rod. He can do a lot of disruption. So it makes you as a ranged assassin feel very ignored. So you can, normally it's like a trouble with your position. Now you can just stand there and kind of throw a hammer. So I think we're going to see that from Falstad. 
I do think the game is ready. Yeah, that's right. It looks like the game is ready, guys. So we're going to go ahead and jump into game number two. See you there. Super perfect team. Wings on Arthas. Aloof Bull on the Ariel. Misaka bringing up Murin and Liang on Bala and Shin Shao on Gul'dan. That's in the blue. Super perfect team on the right. In the red, we've got E Stars and we have got Xing Chen on Illidan. We've got Tao on Rhaegar. Uh, actually, that was Savage on Illidan, excuse me. Xing Chen on Falstad. Uh, Tumi on Tassadar, and of course... Um, Tiger on the Jhana. Yes. The IDs are Tiger on they're Jhana. very truncated with uh, this sponsor logo coming in here. So sometimes it can be very confusing. We'll give you guys our uh, our help if you're having trouble following who is whom. Thank you for your help as well. Um, <laughs> trying to get uh, that completely well, right. With, so here we go. Came with all the uh, roster swaps and everything else, I mean, it's totally understandable to, if, especially if you don't watch Gold Club, uh, you know, if you're a fan out there, to be confused. So we'll give you guys as best uh, as we can to constantly refresh that. Fast up going with that Season Marksman. You referenced the buff it has recently gotten. Just to clarify, Season Marksman gives you bonus auto attack damage uh, for every hero and minion that you kill. Uh, normally it was capped at 40 extra attack damage. Now there is no cap. Once yeah. you reach 40 attack damage, you do still get that reward. Same as before, now also still the same. Uh, you can activate for three seconds to get bonus attack speed. Previously, it was 30% bonus attack speed, now 40%. So it has been buffed in two separate ways. So that makes Falstaff really strong during that period uh, against Arthas and Muradin. Um, you know, the ability to grab minions here on this map too, obviously, with Tailwind, you can rotate between the lanes very quickly without actually using, uh, you know, his flight. And whoa, that was greedy there by Savage, but will not even get punished for it. You can actually stack up those minions very quickly. And, you know, as much as I really agree with everything you and I were brainstorming about Season of Arguments, I'm still surprised we're going to see it because it's just so unpopular right now. You need it against Murd and Arthas. Like, you're never going to kill them with a bit of magic damage. The the way that the, you know, the game works, warriors have really high health pools, which means that when you do an absolute amount of damage, it's less effective, relatively speaking, on a warrior than on a ranged assassin. Whereas when you do percentage-based damage, which is what Giant Killer is, that is going to be relatively more effective on a warrior with a big health pool. And you pretty much need that to get through it. Illidan yeah. can get that as well, as well at level 16, but he'll generally take marks for death for uh, single target damage, which could be on anyone, not just, uh, you know, better against warriors. So I, th I think great choice by Falstad. Gonna pick up hammer gains as well. Gives him life steal for all his auto attacks. Gonna give him really good dueling potential and self sustain there to help with that splash damage that Gudan and Valar are putting out. Yep. Oh, Shin oh, oh, looks like he go will in, go down. Always go in. Barely escapes he there. Every Illidan knows. Always go in to the end of the world. Rich would have gone to in. To get one kill. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he kills you. But that was probably the safest thing to do. I think if he did go in, he would have probably died. Um, some incredible observing here, by the way, uh, from our observer actually to catch both sides of the action. The big positive trade for SPT in the bot lane during all of that. We do see Falstad rotate down to clean up the mess that was left, uh, showing that even though uh, this map is smaller, he uh, can use that trait quite well. In fact, going to use it right now. He's going he hearth back, and now he's going to fly back in to again clean up that mess, as I was saying. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we were shown at BlizzCon as well, in the sense that how the metagame has changed is that globals don't only get used to, to be on one side of the map and then go to the other, like, hello, I'm going to kill you. But, like, actually just to reset your health and mana pool, just like what Brightwing was known for just even over a year ago, now the Hakka and Falsa are seeing that. They are more stationary in their lane and will just trade more than is normally feasible and then use that... Uh, to kind of get back in there with full life and mana. Tiger uses his unstoppable, but Arthas will be in hot pursuit. The Stormbolt hits, and that's going to confirm the kill. Great job there. First takedown by Super Perfect Team. Yeah. Wings unable to get value from the Howling Blast, but still with the path taken there by Tiger, there was no way out. And uh, you could have argued perhaps Tao should have tried to rotate in to the bot if you look at it from just that view we had on screen. But if he did that, so. he would have gotten caught. You know, it's it's yeah. tough to it's tough to really say if he could have actually saved him there. 
but I mean, in the end of the day, Tiger was just simply baited, and that Oriole stun sealed the deal. Whoa! The, um, though, the barrel roll in, false stun going up, <laughs> and actually dies. He feels like with double support, it was enough to keep him alive, but it was not to be so. Liang gets out. Great job there by Super Perfect Team. Uh, a really big gambit there by Eastar to actually try and go for that. Uh, I was surprised by it. I was like, wow, I really misjudged. I'm going to believe that what he did is right, but it turned out not to be <laughs> the case. Yeah, I think they're really relying on uh, the rotation down that we saw there, but it was a little bit too slow, and Vala just called him on his bluff immediately, did yeah. that extra damage. If Vala had panicked and tried to retreat with the revenge, the revenge, the oh. revenge, <laughs> not before Liang actually takes down Tassadar, he will go down, and Xing Chen actually had nothing to do with that except for being the gatekeeper and actually forcing Vala to behave like a cornered badger and taking Tassadar down. Knew there was no escape. Liang is really uh, punishing these moves now. Twice in a row, and this will put them at a huge lead. This was during web levers. They only got the top four, which we aren't focusing on too much because all the action oh, down man. there. Oh man, Chen Xiao really baited and outsmarted him there. Actually, having Illidan go for him, he was at 20% life, and then used his level four talent there, Gul'dan, the, to suck the life out of the minions there and get a lot of extra bonus health. And that actually confirms the kill on Illidan. A big, big snowball here for Super Perfect Team. In all of these little engagements, they are banking off of the fact that E Stars is getting overconfident and they're yeah. punishing them for it. Now, Super Perfect Team nearly has enough for another turn in. So now they can control these turn in points and with their push lanes and their heroics, because they have 10, probably get a second turn in back to back. Now, E Stars only three gems away from a turn in, but without 10, they can't really get those in, barring a huge mistake. And we're going to see Misaka actually commit here. Nice dimensional shift, but the sun comes out right after, and that is going to be the end of Toomey. No escape there, and down he goes. And this furthers the issue that Eastar cannot turn in, although Johanna is trying. Tiger should be denied by Arl. In fact, you, know, you see on the minimap, gets denied. And they now have enough gems with one surplus here for that second turn in, and I believe they're going to get it. There's not much Eastar could do to prevent this. In fact, a late rotation here allows Leong. Oh. All gems in. Xing Chen is about to pay at the top. I would certainly expect Gul'dan to pay. No, it's actually the Red Weaver. <laughs> the Red Weaver is coming out. Unbelievable. Yeah, Misaka missing the Dwarf Plus. I think trying to come as soon as he could, but waiting a little bit there, it seemed. Maybe he was on cooldown with his Storm Bolt, but just not able to deny. And this is great for Eastar because this is going to buy them a little bit of time, alleviate some of that lane pressure we had uh, in, in several of these lanes, but also get them 10. And they won't be facing a, a Web Weavers with Gul'dan and also already heroics for SPT. So that was really important. And Misaka just a little bit late on the jump there to really, deny it. But I don't really know what happened there. I could not really contain my surprise as random words started rolling out that E-Stars two levels down. Talendown can actually get that Web Weaver. Now they're going to be going for Arthas. Wings goes down. Yeah, big, big value there. The fear comes up here as well to try to allow the retreat. It's not, uh, you know, really going to gain any value otherwise. We'll help them escape. This time, Savage is going to commit to going over the cannon towers. Will, of course, use friend or foe to escape, or perhaps actually using that wall there to escape. Uh, but this is a pretty significant push here for E-Star. The Web Weavers clearing those lanes. Now, you might be thinking, well, SPT got a fort with theirs. Why can't E-Star? Well, the lanes were already pushed against them, even with, uh, you know, that first kill and that big win in the fight, they're still unable to find structural damage here. Yeah, it's a good point. They don't get the fort, but I think E-Star is countering their lucky stars here just for the fact that they are able to turn that level of disparity uh, back in their favor, uh, or at least in a kind of balance where they have equal talents. They were 9 versus 11, Wolf, and managed to get a kill and a Web Weaver that was kind of stolen away from SPT or, or given to E-Star. All right. At this moment in time, this is actually a really tense moment because both teams have enough turn to turn in. Now, Eastar will take them longer to do so. Obviously, uh -huh. Xing nearly gets taken out. And Liang, actually, maybe the first mistake he's made this game is wasting that strafe. That's a long 55 second cooldown. It's a lot of damage lost for the next fight. But SBT just needs simply one more gem, and I think they will get it. There's no denial this time. Looks like Toomey got one more Size Storm off, but actually, Jin Shao decided to go for damage instead of continuing that turn in. And ooh, a big oh. flight in here. Cleanse goes down. That's going to help him out quite a bit. Mighty Gus gets used to isolate Murden. Not exactly the one that you want to tackle, even with five people, as he doesn't go down fast enough. Ch Chen Xiao now is paying five gems, but the interrupt there by Tiger. Good job. Will he pay for it with his life, though? 
Uh, it looks like he is going to get away using that iron skin there. Big stun goes down onto Toomey. Looks like he's just barely going to escape. Big Blessed Shield goes off. But it's just simply going to allow them to retreat, saving Toomey's life there. Finally, SPT does get the final turn in, that last gem they needed. They do have 13, but this time the lanes are pushed against them. And it's yeah. going to take them some time to clear. We're not seeing this game really swing heavily one way or the other. It's pretty even all throughout. It seems the SPT is slightly winning, but not by too much. Eastar just did a really good move, delaying the Webweaver for as long as they did. That gives them level 13, which makes the defense a lot easier. So it's actually very key. Everything that Sink Chen and Tiger did, the Drana and Palsta, to delay the Web Weavers for as long as they did. Now, the top Web Weaver, no need to deep push it too fast. This one is the biggest threat. That's why we see four people here. And in the meantime, Palsta is basically single handedly taking down the bottom. SPT not getting a whole lot done with this. Could fly in and go for a gust. Here's the flight, and he comes. Oh, Big the meter! Horrified! Palsta goes down <laughs> instantly. Ouch! I mean, that was just a wonderfully uh, placed horrify by Chen Xiao. It was also so broadcasted. The thing about Falstad's flight is that he it shows his flight location to yeah. both sides, so you're able to immediately say, wow, he's super greedy, drop down that horrify immediately. Now, it was an amazing horrify because it was, you know, the reaction time there was so sick, but I think it was pretty overzealous by Xing Shen to actually attempt this move. That death will cost them a key wall in mid. Yeah. Fairly early on in this game, before 11 minutes, and they're vastly approaching level 16 yeah, uh, SPT, with this ESP as well. SPT was struggling to find value out of this Web Weaver, and Xing Chen kind of gave it to them. It's 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 quite a shame. It's not the first blunder he's made in this game. Um, hopefully for him and e stars it's the last, because SPT is starting to grow their advantage here. Now, uh, Illidan it remains a force to be reckoned with. We haven't really seen him go ham yet. Like we have seen, perhaps, in Arthur's Burden, there has been that defense against him. He's starting to come in now. Level 16 has not been reached. SPT thinks it's a good fight to take anyway, just because of the positioning, the fact that Illidan wasn't there yet. Big Metamorphosis comes out. Can he stay alive? Ancestral healing is not available. Oh, man. E-Star needs to get out of here. They're so low. Down goes the gust, but every single engage is just not going their way. Gul'dan in these choke points is getting so much value. You know, his Echo Corruption is, if it's not done already, probably nearly done with how many times he's hit it. And I just feel like the one thing that stands out to me with E-Star's comp is obviously Illidan, and he's not doing anything. He's not able to accomplish anything. He's out-zoned, out-positioned, and just burned down yeah. every single time. I mean, Johanna is a very medium damage dealer. Burning Rage is the main source of her damage. It's not enough to really burst someone down. Rhaegar can do b decent burst, but just once. Tassadar has no damage at all. And it's pretty much just Illidan Falstad, but Illidan is a finisher. Yeah, and that's why, that's part of the reason why I really felt, even though I don't agree with the choice, and I, I like the season Markman instead, thought we might see Mage Falstad just to get that burst on yeah, those yeah. squishy assassins, because it's risky, it's tough to do, but if you can get that value, it's amazing. It's pretty much a counterattack uh, team here for E-Star. They can't really engage burst and then finish. They have to kind of weather the storm of SPT and then jump in after uh, life starts to drop low for SPT, but it never really happens. The synergy here with Aureo and Vala means that everyone stays stopped off. We never see that opportunity for A-Star. And you know what, Wolf? It could have looked different if all these little skirmishes in the beginning would have looked different if Falstad got fried a little bit less sometimes by yeah, SPT. Yeah, no, I mean, when you talk about the value, we were sub 13 minutes to see a mid keep come down. That is very rare. Um, you know, barring some like Korea versus SEA games or something like that. That just <laughs> doesn't happen. And Jing Shen's mistake there cost them the mid wall, which meant this next push cost them a keep. And we have a keep down this early. This game could start to snowball out of control from East, or excuse me, from SPT. A super perfect team pushes down now a second keep. Don't think they'll be able to get this one, but they do take out the wall and they do damage it significantly. Can E-Star make something happen? They're on 16 now. They do have Gus. They this is their moment. The this yeah. is their moment. The level 16 equal talents. They're starting to push in. They have a lot of Kalas and Brace. Bonus shields here. Blessed Shield goes down on Vala. They're going to go for Vala. The Young is getting targeted by Savage. He's going to be jumping in. Uh, he dodges the detainment strike by Ariel. Gets the cleanse. Ancestral healing is not available. Savage, he needs more support. I'm not sure he has it. Oh. Shield in. But the Crystal Aegis turns is against him. Illidan explodes.
perfect usage there of the Horrify as well. Again, they were saving that for the key moment. Horrify hits, I believe, four there. Now they're going to turn this fight and possibly just end the game. Down goes Tiger, and that is two dead here. Nice force wall here to slow down the advance. It looks like SPT will just simply commit to going for this keep instead of pushing to end the game. Tough to end the game this early. I mean, we don't normally see uh, moves like this in a dead keep at 14 minutes on this map, so maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Oh, no, stun goes down here again. The Shen. Huge shields trying to keep him alive. Looks like he will survive. There's that counter damage when you can't confirm the kill by SPT E-Stars starting to do so much pressure on the front line, but it is still a three versus five. Rhaegar slightly overextends here. I mean, it's a difficult situation. They're trying to kind of fish for an overextension of Super Perfect Team, but E-Stars is unable to make that work and will have another chain death. Uh, you know, what's interesting too is we see even like the commitment to Lightning Bond coming out here and, you know, a, a, an update that maybe Black took out Astral Authority um, real talk, I'm not sure that was a big surprise for most, but, uh, you know, we don't we didn't get to see the games yet, so I'm looking forward to check that one out and see how Astral did. I know that they were talking about being excited to challenge MVP Black and see how much, you know, improvement they made since BlizzCon. But yeah, I mean, all these commitments even to the Lightning Bond on Rhaegar to try to get that value out of Illidan and to get into this big, divey, aggressive team just has not been working for E-Star. And sometimes when you see an Illidan pick, you're terrified, especially with double support with something like Tastar. But in this game, SPT has just been outplaying them at every turn. Yeah, Misaka really stepped it up from last game as well. He's been really good on that Murden. Is now seeking his next target. Goes for Falstad, denies the damage that Falstad may be able to do, which pretty much leaves Illidan alone. But it's going to be enough for now. Illidan confirms the kill on Vala. It is one down each. Savage, no ancestral healing available for him. Once again, he's going to go and kill Ariel. Tastar shields. Keeping him alive, this Wings. is the big turnaround that Easter was looking for. This is what Savage wanted. He's finally starting to get all those kills he needed. Now this is suddenly Christmas. Eastar hits that boss right before 20. They know they can actually, because the boss is being taken, it's, first of all, it's a risky move uh, by SPT, one of the riskier moves they've made so far in this series. But they go in, they know that they can either punish this or force them to retreat because 20 isn't ready yet. It looks like we're going to take a look at this again. Coming in here, the fear this time only hits Tiger. The Ancestral actually heals him here. Aegis is used early, which means Zilong can't you know, survive the second attacks there from Savage. Even with the detainment strikes here, they, just can't, they can't kill Savage, and he just has a field day and wipes the rest of the team here off the map. Not sure if it's worth ancestral healing Johanna. She pretty much stayed alive for four seconds more, kind of doing some burning rage. I feel like those need to be saved for Illidan, but I could be very wrong as well, as that was a great fight for Eastar. They only lost Johanna, killed four. Of course, it came at a big price, which is why SPT was actually willing to take that fight. The boss destroyed the only remaining keep here. It's six structures versus zero yeah they weren't even able to get a fort off of that four man and uh, kill there which and they is couldn't crazy they couldn't deny the boss either i i praise e-star for this fight but it's one step of many they will need to re yeah. recover in this game because they are going to have three spawning catapults every minion wave pressuring their lanes they need big wipes they need to force yeah, two yeah. fights sooner rather than later they don't have 20 yet so they're trying to get that before they fight it's just now reached they do have their storm talents and normally I would say you need three fights like that to get, come back from a big, uh, uh, you know, deficit like this. From being at the edge of the precipice and about to fall in, you need to take a lot of steps to get away from that danger. Now with the Web Weavers, one fight might be able to do it, but because they aren't getting it, E-Stars needs two more miracles, basically, to get back into this game. Whereas SPT doesn't really need to perform magic to really stay ahead in this game and put a lot of... Uh, pressure on the E-Star here in the sense that three catapults are going to be pushing. Important cleanse was just used on Tiger there, perhaps a bit over, uh, it really just overkill there, not even necessarily important to use there because he was going to get out no matter what with his iron skin. So that is going to be off cooldown for a little while here. And uh, something that SPT could actually try to punish for. It looks like the last of the Web Weavers will finally be cleared off here. No turn ins available for either team. And this is a clock working against E Star right now as they haven't been able to take off a single one of those keeps. In fact, one fort still remaining uh, in the bot lane. Yeah, what a match between these two Chinese teams here in this best of two of the Gold Club World Championship. It's really going the long way. It is one. Zero for E-Star, the next map will determine 
whether it's going to be a draw or a victory for E-Star. Keep in mind that the top four teams of the eight-team round of Robin will go straight to the winner bracket, whereas the poorest performing four teams will be in the loser bracket, which means they have no more leeway to lose any series in the second stage of the tournament in the water cube here in Beijing, China. Now, by many people's considerations, these are one of the strongest teams to take a game off them to get one point off this team in your round robin would be huge for SPT. And we do see a fight attempt here for SPT. They're not going to try to push the issue because they simply don't have to. E-Star is nowhere near a turn-in at 42 of 60 with zero gems currently in the the satch, or whatever that, that is called, the clutch. The, the satchel. The satchel, one more yeah. notch on the helmet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anyway, you know what? I'm super surprised here by Vala's choice. She went, at level 20, she went for Vengeance, a stronger heroic, rather than 40% bonus range on her auto attack. Uh, I guess she considered Illidan is always on her anyway. Just wants to generate bonus energy for Ariel, the bonus damage. Uh, just really different styles here coming out of China, but it does look like things are going to be coming to a head here. Johanna uses her Iron Skin, draws a lot of abilities, but th there goes the Storm Shield Ooh. by Rhaegar. I can't agree with that Storm Shield. They no. have to say Tao has definitely made some questionable decisions with his support abilities in this game. Savage goes in on the Liang again. Big flight in as well. Seems like there's a little bit of a discoordination between these teams. A huge oh. gust! Metamorphosis clips only two people as there was a slight anti-synergy there between the Mighty Gust and the Metamorphosis. Grubby, I completely feel that last fight was some miscommunication. Targeting there was split oh, between two sides. Oh, Blessed Shield misses as well. It's getting really hard this far in the game to hit abilities here as both teams are descending into chaos here. No takedowns yet, but both teams are so tense here for this second game. All right, Savage. Savage, he wants it here on Leon. To secure the kill, and now E Star is in trouble. Misaka escapes. They are going to try to re engage here with Condemn running forward now. Ancestral Healing just hit on Illidan. He Bolt of the Storm out. By the way, Bolt of the Storm, lol. On Illidan, on Illidan. yeah. Normally it's like Metamorphosis. I forgot he even had that. <laughs> I mean, normally it's like you go the hunt and then you Bolt out because actually you can't go the hunt, you're just going to die. <laughs> but like, he actually sacrifices cool, like, he sacrifices crowd control reduction from his heroic infinite bonus attack speed and metamorphosis like twice like you have that form the demonic form where you can mount i mean there's so many advantages in this level 20 upgrade of heroic that it just blows my mind he went for a bolt it does make a kind of sense though he has been kind of isolated Falstad can't follow him as far into the back line so he kind of wants to escape after a horrify oh tau whiffs the storm shield again very early here the detainment strike does go off on Tiger with a fake boss. SPT wanted to force this fight. They had vision control. Misaka eating a lot of damage. Uh, that's vengeance used on Liang. That's a great moment for Easters to pull back. Uh, horrifying Crystal Aegis are available, but crucially, Ancestral was not available. That means that Easters didn't really want this fight anyway. And Amorphous is back. 25 seconds to Ancestral. Yeah. And there's no pressure for Eastars really to stop the turn in. The real pressure is make sure that those bottom and mid lane can push out a bit. Not sure why Eastars is taking the fight yet. It's really risky. This is not the time for them to do it. They really need to go back to the core. If they get delayed oh, here. They're, they're going to take core damage in 10 seconds. Yeah. Wolf. They actually are going to lose this game no matter what happens essentially here. Barring a miracle, a big fear, buying more time for that core. The shields are already gone, and here comes Falstay. He's going to fly back. He alone should be able to help clear this, this up. Actually, you know what? Maybe it's not. You know he does. It's going to go to 10%. It's just simply going to go down, I think. Uh, 25, 22, 22 there we 17. Go. You just need to four kind more of, will do it. Yeah, you just got to blow on the core. Misaka is going to kind of jump on it. They're just going to commit to the core He's here. He's going to hit it with a rusty spoon. He's hitting it with a rusty spoon, and it's enough. The that core goes down. is going to be it. GG. And SPT will close it out, bringing us to a 1-1 score in this best of two in our round robin stage. Very impressive play by SPT there. And again, I do really feel that it's so important when you look at a round robin system like this, which team you take points off of really matters. Because you look at some teams like, oh, I'm going to get two points on them no matter what because I'm just better than them and I right. know that. But it, to take a point off E-Star is great for SPT going into, you know, we've still got two more whole days of matches, but it's a great start. Yeah, and it is. And um, I mean, they played this game really well, SPT. They won the individual skirmishes. I feel like they won the draft and they played 
better. They had better heroic synergies, they had good team fights, good understanding of the map, and even when they made sacrifices with some uh, deaths that they had, they managed to secure the objective. Three keeps virtually untouched the entire game. They controlled this game from start to end with some shakiness, but overall really, really good play. And Gul'dan was incredible here. Yeah, uh, you know, as you can see, he didn't really I don't think he end up getting any kills himself, which is actually quite rare for Gul'dan because yeah. of his tick damage. But um, we saw a really excellent Horrifice, and I think that that's really why where the award goes in. He did get some large value from Poke. Um, to be honest, for me, my my personal pick would have probably been Liang. I think he played really, really well, um, despite being put uh, all the odds against him. And Aloof Fool as well, also keeping him alive with some really critical ages there. I feel like the team fighting we saw overall really was what won SBT that game. We saw some really early usages of Storm Shield from Tao. We also yeah. saw some early cleanses, sometimes unnecessary. And when you look at how well Aloof Fool played compared to uh, Tao, which is your support is so important when you're doing an Illidan comp. I think that's part of why uh, SPT ended up taking the win at the end of all things. So of course that was uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen, which will be won by Super Perfect Team. A 1-1 one -one means one point will be attributed to both teams. And it was a pretty good victory here for Super Perfect Team. And that's pretty much the beginning of both of these teams here into this round robin. Um, and they have a lot more opposition to go up against. Uh, there's the other Chinese team, Zero Panda, Europe's Dignitas, um, and then we have uh, Astro Authority for America, and of course, the three Korean teams, MVP Black, MVP Miracle, uh, as well as Team Ballistics, the reigning champion of BlizzCon. That's right, and you know, if you enjoyed that super fiery back-to-back -back team fight, non-stop action from these two Chinese teams, Check out Gold Club, because that's where this happens all the time, a regular league that happens in China. And uh, that's just a taste of what we'll be seeing uh, in this tournament, of course, with three Chinese teams. We're going to see a lot of uh, China versus China, um, you know, battles going on in this round robin. But guys, we are going to take a short break before we come back with, of course, Dreadnought and Dunk Train. We'll see you guys in just a few.